Welcome to Minimalish. I'm your host, Desiree, and I want to encourage you to walk towards a simplified life and make room for what matters to you. Minimalism is the movement that's all about having less stuff so that you have more time for the things that you care about. It's become a pretty big thing and it's changed my life. But sometimes it feels like minimalism has become about subscribing to a trendy movement and trying to do it perfectly. My goal is to help you find a sustainable, realistic version of minimalism that actually makes sense for your life. Minimalish is about grace-filled minimalism. It certainly is not about doing it perfectly. And each week, We'll talk about the topics of simple living, motherhood, decluttering, slowing down, mindset shifts, and everything else in between that will help us move towards a more intentional life. And I'll often invite a guest on to chat with me about these topics as well. I'm so glad you're here, friend. Let's dive in. Hi, friend. Welcome back to Minimalish. I am so excited about today's episode I get to talk to one of my favorite authors and I just feel really grateful for the opportunity that I had to talk with Erin Lochner. So I am thinking that if you've heard more than one episode of this podcast, you might have heard me recommend her book, Chasing Slow. And in today's episode, we are going to talk about that book a little bit, but we're actually going to focus in on the idea of homeschooling. Right now, we have been in a series for the last several episodes talking about how minimalism fits into our choices with work and with school as a mom. So while this series cannot possibly be all-inclusive because it's only spanning a little over a month of the show, which is one episode per week, we just can't possibly cover every aspect of the work we can choose for our lives and every aspect of the type of schooling we can choose for our children. But I wanted to kind of jump around, talk to different women and moms who are doing different things with their work and their schooling for their kids, and to hear their perspectives and to just gain insight from them. So that's what today is going to be about. And Erin Lochner actually runs a company called Other Goose. We're going to talk a lot about that because what I love about it is that it's actually not just for homeschooling families. It is for anyone who wants a way to connect with their kids through learning. So keep listening for more info on that. But Erin's also going to talk to us about what her day looks like as a stay-at-home mom who homeschools her two young children. And I just love the slow pace that she describes and the simplicity in her homeschooling approach. So whether you are a homeschooling mom or not, or you plan to be in the future, listen in because I think Erin's slow approach to living and parenting can just inspire all of us. Erin is also giving listeners an opportunity to try out Other Goose for free, which is super amazing. I'm excited about that for all of us. So listen in towards the end to hear more about that. If this episode speaks to you, inspires you, or you just enjoy listening to it, share it with a friend, share it on Instagram. I say this all the time, but it is the best way to help Minimalish grow and reach other women. And I'm so thankful for you all for helping me get more ears on Minimalish by sharing it. Okay, so today, like I said, I've got Erin Lochner. I already told you she's the author of one of my favorite books, Chasing Slow, and she's the founder of Other Goose, which is an international homeschooling co-op, and she's been blogging and speaking for more than a decade. She's gonna tell us more about that, and she's even had an HGTV.com web special, which is really cool, but she lives in the Midwest with her husband and her two kids, and they strive for less except for in the areas of joy and grace, which I can fully relate. I love her message. I think you're going to love her too. So let's dive in. Hi, Erin. Thank you so much for coming on Minimalish today. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. Also, I love the name of your podcast. It's so good. Well, I'm so glad that you do. I Honestly, a lot of what I talk about has been inspired by the journey that your book took me through. So I'm just so thankful to be talking to you today. But before we really get started, tell our listeners who you are and what you do. Um, and even if you want to tell us like how minimalism has played a role in your life and your work in general. Yes, of course. Well, I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I have just been really surprised by this season. So I've had 
a lot of iterations of work. Um, they've kind of all branched from my first blog, uh, Design for Mankind, almost 20 years ago, I started blogging. Wow. But, um, I know. So I followed just a ton of passions. Uh, when I lived in LA, I was an art director and a gallery curator. So art was kind of my life. And then we moved to the Midwest and I hosted a HGTV.com renovation show for two years and 24 episodes. So design and renovation was kind of my life. And then, then I had a baby and I wrote a book and I adopted a baby. And I just feel like everything is kind of evolved from there. In my most recent season, um, I founded and launched an international homeschooling co-op for the early years, which is Other Goose. And I, th I think that's really where minimalism has been a really integral mindset for me in just the realization that even in walking through so many past jobs and interests, understanding that, that none of these things happened all at the same time, right? I've always been a very singular vision focused person. Um, and my only rule about my work is that it has to fit in my real everyday life. So when something shifts in that life, I just find a way to let my business and creativity fit into that rather than force my life to fit into my, into my business. I just, I don't believe that work is a distraction from life or that our lives are a distraction from work. I think that our lives are our work and our play and our song. And I truly, truly believe that they can be all of those things if we're willing to get really curious and kind of simplify and also really bend the rules a little bit. Yeah, I love that. And I'll just kind of say this one more time for our listeners who haven't maybe, you know, heard of you or read your book, that it is really a life-changing perspective on minimalism. And I kind of burned out of minimalism because it felt like a lot of roles. Um, it really changed my life at first, and then it felt like a lot of roles that I had to fit into. And mm -hmm. you're reading your book, I kind of stumbled upon it, kind of gave me this new refreshing view. So I highly recommend it to anyone who's listening. Can you tell me a little bit about your journey in writing that? Um, you know, I feel exactly the same. I did, I, I grew up very minimalist, right? Like we were a very frugal family and my parents didn't believe in a lot of stuff and my mother did not believe in shopping for sport. So it was just, that's how I was raised. And then you kind of, you kind of brainwash yourself at some point. I don't know. I don't know when it happened or how it happened, but I kind of thought the American dream that amassing and more and better and faster and stronger. And, and I burned out in that direction. So I kind of just stripped everything away and I kind of just became equally obsessed with the other way around, right? Like yeah. um, less and, and simple. And when my life looked simple, but didn't feel simple, I felt like I had this epiphany, like, oh, problems are forever. Like it, it, we're just, we're just kind of switching the name of our problems, right? We're, we're never going to be in that place where it's like, ah, here we are. Because even when you do kind of chase that change, and even if you do receive that change and, and work for that change, you're still you on the other side of it. So it, I think there's that thought that, oh, if I become a minimalist, everything will work out for the better. Life will feel simple. And it, it, it might not. It might yeah, it might feel simple, it might look simple, but so much of it is mindset. So for me, I had to understand, I mean, this is a quote from the book, but I had to understand that without grace, minimalism is just another metric for perfection. It's the same thing as, as chasing fast uh, when we chase slow. And perhaps the goal is to sort of surrender and release the chase entirely. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that uh, you said like it, your life maybe looked simple, but it didn't feel simple. And I feel like, you know, that it can become such like a competition with yourself and that's just not what it's all about. So I'm just really thankful for the fact that you put that into writing and um, the fact that you recognize that, yeah, problems <laughs> are forever. It's never really like, it's never really finished, right? We have to just lean on grace through everything. Yes. Yes. And wouldn't it be boring if it was finished? Right. And right. I, don't know, I just, yes, I'm still learning a lot through that, but it's been, it's just been really valuable to kind of take away the mechanics of what this simple living thing should look like and realize that your husband doesn't have to whittle you a hickory table from a tree or whatever. I mean, <laughs> it just doesn't have to look one way. 
Yeah, yeah. So good. Okay, so let's talk about homeschooling. Um, right now on the podcast, we're actually talking about work and school. We're do- I'm doing a longer series on it. So um, this episode will be a part of that. And I would love to hear, um, and we're going to get into kind of your project of Other Goose and what that is all about. But I'd love to hear kind of what went into your own decision and passion behind homeschooling. So, you know, it kind of started when my husband and daughter and I were in Singapore for the summer and we totally missed the preschool registration. I I remember just like kind of (laughs) like I felt like I was so irresponsible. Like, what am I? Why didn't I know about this? Like, I don't know. I, I don't know why I assumed there would be like a flyer sent out like, oh, it's time to register for your child for school or whatever. There's no flyer. And so, um, I was so kind of freaked out that she was going to get behind if she skips preschool and like, what do you do now? And I felt myself like spiraling. And then I thought, wait a minute, who says that we're not learning right now, right here in Singapore, where we are from this beautiful culture that is totally different than our own. Um, And if school is supposed to be the goal of learning, uh, right? If they're supposed to be synonymous, why am I not doing school now? And it, it was really interesting because as soon as we began to get kind of curious about what that would look like, I, I didn't know anyone homeschooling growing up. I never, my parents are both two public school teachers. Okay. So I had never been exposed to that. I had, I didn't have any preconceived notions, which in a way was kind of helpful for me. Um, and it was almost as if our lives started to be kind of orchestrated by the idea, like other families who homeschooled kind of showed up in my life. Um, and I got front row seats to see how other people did it. And most importantly, um, how differently everybody does it. And it just became this lifestyle that I was really curious about that seemed kind of appealing for us um, and for our unique position as a family. My husband also freelances, I freelance. We have super flexible schedules. We both are very involved in our kids' life, so we love the idea of relying on his strengths and his passions, and then mine as well. They, they couldn't be more opposite. We have different everythings, different parenting styles, different interests, different hobbies, different philosophies, and so it's kind of a beautiful mix, but I don't know. The, the funny thing is the same thing happened when it came time to register our oldest for kindergarten. We were in Ecuador, <laughs> so I just... <laughs> totally spaced the registration. And I thought, you know what, this is getting crazy. We're just going to do this. We're going to try it out for a year and see how it works. Yeah. And how is your oldest, how old is your oldest now? And you're still homeschooling? Yes. She's seven and our oldest is three. And we just agreed to kind of reassess year by year and take it a little bit at a time and reassess child by child. Right. I, I don't believe, I don't believe in holding anything too tightly and gripping to a point that it's unhealthy for our family. So it's been working it's been incredible. Uh, Just the growth in my children and also the growth in myself has been really uh, beautiful to see. Yeah. I love that too, that, you know, you seem really passionate about homeschooling and just like what it's been and what it's done for your family. But the fact that you're not holding it too tightly, because that's kind of how I see, you know, my daughter's two right now. So we're a little bit away from the choice of schooling in general, but I love the idea that, you know, learning happens every day and we can take it year by year. That's probably what we will do too. So I'd love to hear though, because you started this thing called Other Goose. So tell me about that. Um, Tell our listeners about what that is and why you started it, how you started it, everything like that. Yeah. So other goose, I feel like this is what we do as entrepreneurs, right? You make the thing that you want like, for yourself selfishly. Um, it's just what I needed when I started out. It, it's a way to stay on track and accountable and motivated um, while keeping kind of the bigger picture in mind about what education actually means. Um, I remember just when we, when we first started on the journey, I felt like I needed to just research and research and research. Um, it was so overwhelming. I remember sifting through all this curriculum and so much of it was geared toward toward older kids, like going to an art museum uh, or, you know, whatever. All I kept thinking about was like, oh, my toddler would definitely throw a tantrum in the MoMA and it would like echo through all the marble (laughs) floors and I would just crumble from embarrassment. For some reason that all of the ideas that other people suggested just felt like they they felt very intimidating to me at the age and stage in which we were in. Uh, 
And then the stuff that was geared toward the age and stage we were in, right, the, the toddlers or the young children, they felt um, very manipulated experiences, right? Like I needed to spend my mornings making, I don't know, rainbow rice sensory bins and 12 ingredient science experiments, right? And, or that we needed flashcards and like fresh muffins to do this thing really well. And instead, I just thought, okay, I'm going to come up with a list of what my kids really need for me, right? What, what I think my kids need for me. And born from that question was just a really weird, simple curriculum. Um, and I've been using it on my own kids ever since. It's, we call it prep free and prop free because you won't spend like hours getting anything ready. We don't believe in buying new materials. Um, so Other Goose is kind of this community of people that are working through this curriculum together, and it's cutting out all the fluff, right? You get five lessons a week. Each lesson is crazy simple, um, and, it, and they're kind of prompts, right? Like the, the goal is to sort of lead, kind of to like prepare your child for a learning environment, but, but sort of let them branch out into what they're seeking to learn at that same time. So um, we call them prompts, but one of the lessons included is for the parent because so you get you get five a week but also there's one for the parent because i feel like homeschooling especially in these early years are so much less about teaching our kids and more about teaching ourselves right so that's a really important feature um there's this really fun marketplace element where you earn free resources for completing lessons with your kids because i just feel like i don't know it makes the whole thing way more fun and motivating for those days that you just kind of want to throw in the towel. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's been really, really fun. That's awesome. And it's not just for homeschooling parents, right? Yes, thank you for saying that. It's it's funny. We have probably a 50-50 split. We have so many families that are in it just as ways to connect with their kids around the dinner table or on weekends. Um, I have one member who's just, oh she's so much fun but she's a full-time working parent and so she calls every Saturday her other goose day and they just hit all five lessons in one afternoon right they play music and they just make it fun and relaxing and um yeah so it's really it's for anybody it's for kids so the, the kid range is two to seven um simply because that's what I know that's what I feel like I'm qualified for but um any, any family with a kid age two to seven, whether they're in Waldorf or Montessori or public school or private school, I, I am not a homeschooling purist. I don't believe that there's one way to educate a kid. So these are really kind of beautiful connecting points for the family altogether. Yeah, and I actually signed up for the recent challenge you all did. Um, and I just loved how that was focused on connecting with our kids. And like I said, my daughter's not even two yet. You know, I kind of like took them and was like, okay, how can I apply them to her? Um, but we had fun painting, you know, as a, tr with a tree as our easel. And it was just fun to have kind of prompts to, to make it easy to be like, okay, this is something fun and different we can do. It doesn't have to be stressful. Like it can just be something we already had the materials for. So um, I'm just thankful for what you're doing. It's really, I think, helpful and it's simple and it just is giving parents a way to connect with their kids and have fun doing it. I'm so glad you did it. I'm so glad you did the challenge. It's, I find that too, there's that thing that happened, like when you, when you need to connect, isn't always when you're in the best frame of mind to come up with an idea to connect. Yeah. At least that's been my experience, right? Like I can tell when my kids are like frazzled beyond the point of, I haven't connected with you on a, like a real level yet today. And, and I find that I'm in like reactive mode and it's really hard to get creative with finding something new to do or exciting to do or engaging to do. So it is nice to have all those ideas in your back pocket, I think as well for when you do hit that time of day. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay. So let's dig into a little bit about like what homeschooling looks like for you. So what does your homeschooling day look like with a seven-year-old and a three-year-old? So it's funny. It's kind of the same thing. I, we're coming off the tail end of summer. It's probably the same thing that most parents summer day look like, right? Because it, we just believe learning is really infused with what we're already doing. Um, so there's not a ton of formal learning taking place uh, with kids under seven and under, meaning we're not like piling on worksheets or I'm not making elaborate unit studies. Uh, we do a lot of everyday math, like with baking. Um, I'm getting so good at fractions. My kids are such whizzes at fractions, right? <laughs> 
but I don't, we, we have this kind of fun tradition where we walk to the local diner. It's a, it's a mile and a half away. Um, we bring our own little Tupperware because my seven year old um, recently learned about how many sea turtles are dying from takeout containers and plastic straws. And she's become like this hyper mega environmentalist for it. So we'll like walk to the diner, bring our own Tupperware. We stop at the library across the street from the diner um, and get a few books to read over breakfast. And then we always get a stack of pancakes to go. And on our way home, we return the books at the library and then we get new books. And then we like stop at the playground by our house to eat pancakes um, with our hands and swing from the monkey bars. And it's, it's like the best tradition because it's what you would do anyway, but you're kind of just being a little more thoughtful about what you're learning, where your conversations are headed. Um, you're hitting like going outside, um, heading to the library. It's fun to eat diner food. You don't have to cook. I mean, they're just, it's, it's just looking for all of those small traditions that you can infuse in your day um, to do something interesting together as a family. Um, also, there are tantrums. I feel like I realize I'm making it sound kind of picturesque. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, so it, this is really important for me to say, because I feel like so many people tell me they couldn't homeschool because they're not patient enough. And I just, I don't believe that patience is a prerequisite. I think it's a byproduct, right? Mm -hmm. You learn it by doing it. it. Patience does not come naturally for anybody I know. Homeschooling doesn't come naturally for anybody. Parenting doesn't come naturally for anybody I know. It's just, we have that in our head. And it's so funny because I feel like if any one of us were to like show our kids a bike, right? They, our kids would never say, oh, I could never do that. I'm not balanced enough, <laughs> right? Like, they would never say that, but, but they, they understand inherently that you learn by doing it. And I feel like patience is totally that. And homeschooling is totally that. It's the learning by doing. Yeah, I love that. It sounds like you keep it very simple and you do what seems right for you and your kids in that day. Hi, friend. I just wanted to interrupt this episode to tell you about two quick things. The first one is that the 200K giveaway is happening right now. So we are celebrating the fact that Minimalish has hit over 200,000 downloads. And we're doing that by doing a giveaway on Instagram. So you can hop on over there to at minimalish.desiree and see what it's all about. I'm excited about it. The second thing I wanted to tell you about is that if you are kind of thinking about diving into minimalism... Or if you're just wondering like what it looks like to dive deeper, maybe you've started decluttering, but you're not sure about how minimalism can really flow down in your life to your schedule and to your mindset, check out my free resource. You can get it at DesireeEndries.com slash store. You can get all of my free resources there actually, but you can get my free ebook that will really help you move towards starting your minimalist journey. It gives you some tips for some short decluttering projects and it really helps you get to taking it deeper right from the start because I think if we keep it surface level, minimalism is not going to be a lasting thing in our lives. We've got to dive deep from the beginning, rooting it in why we actually want to do this and that resource will help you do that. So again, head to DesireeEndries.com slash store if you want to check that out or any of my other free resources, you can find them all there. All right, let's get back to the show. So I have a question about materials and homeschooling. And I know that you can mostly speak to like seven and under. But how do you, I don't know, I, I feel like they're, for me, like looking forward, I feel like I'm a former teacher too. So I feel like I'd have this sense of like, I need to have every material that I need and I, you know, that's out there. I need to research, like you said, like research everything and it becomes really overwhelming. So how do you keep it like simple with materials and like even keeping a less cluttered homeschooling environment? Cause I could just see that that could become really overwhelming. Yes. Well, it's so funny. I feel like the former teachers have it the hardest because they have this picture in their head of what structured learning should look like. Or yeah. Yes. And I even had, I have a friend who is a former teacher. Uh, she's teacher of the year, superstar and decided to homeschool her kids. And she had this moment where they were like doing their curriculum and their kids are a little older and her son's like sprawled out on the floor. And she's like, you have to go to the kitchen table. You can't learn like that. And he's like, 
I'm doing really great. I'm totally focused. I can tell you what this passage is about or whatever. And she's like, oh, you can learn on the floor. You can learn by laying down. Like it it just, she had trained her mind to think that learning is at a desk with your number two pencils and all of that. So I do feel like you guys have it the hardest for sure. Um, I think for me, keeping things simple is, is just being really focused and intentional about what our kids need from us in that season and that, and just being there in that season. Uh, so I don't know what it's going to look like when I do have to start buying formal curriculum. I can't envision myself going overboard in that department. And here's, here's why I think we really discount our community, the one we've already been given. Um, just looking around and thinking, what do the adults and kids you know have to offer your family? And, and what can you offer? So my oldest daughter has is been taking Chinese lessons for five years because we have a friend in our life from Taiwan. And I thought, oh, well, that's a cool thing. I don't know anybody else that speaks Mandarin. And I just asked her if we could do like a swap. Like, I, like could she, could my daughter come over at the age of two and have tea parties and with their family. Right. And, Mm -hmm. and just play There's nothing formal happening, uh, but just kind of immersion language. And that's something that I would never have found a curriculum for, or never even dreamed of, of putting, uh, just putting in the, in the path of my family. And yet it's been such a beautiful experience. And, And now we, you know, my daughter is, I, she's not fluent by any stretch, but she can understand other people that are speaking Chinese and she knows what they're saying and we can go test it out. And, um, and that is the same for everybody in your life, right? If you have an, an uncle who fishes and you're not necessarily an outdoor person, <laughs> then, mm-hmm. then arrange to um, have them pour into your kids' lives. I have never, ever, ever asked another adult, hey, could you teach my child this skill and have them say, oh, no, never, not once. Uh, It is a beautiful gift for everybody. The adult loves it. The kid loves it. Um, My kids have learned to bake from a beloved aunt. Um, I just think if we start with what we've already been given, that's a really good jumping off point. Um, And then I think being really clear about what those pillars are, like those three things you want to get done in a day uh, with your kids. So mine are reading aloud, um, going outside, and then we do our our other goose lesson. And it's simple stuff. You know, one of the lessons this week is have a staring contest with your kid because that eye contact is so important. Um, And for me, thinking about what your day looks like and habit stacking. So if you want to make sure you get that read aloud time in, do it during meal times when the kids mouths are full of food and they're not going to interrupt you or they're not going to fight it or whatever, finding things in your life that you're already doing and just sort of adding what your goal is for your kid to that thing that you're already doing. Um, I think too, you know, when I think about curriculum, and choosing the right curriculum, whatever that means, whatever's right. Um, It's really important to be mindful of the marketing attached to it. I used to feel like even with a two-year-old, I needed to start her off on the right foot and buy the right things. Um, But if you kind of look at it, a lot of the marketing is really fear-based, right? Like if you don't buy this, your kid is going to fall behind, or these unit studies are going to boost them up a grade level. And I think, I think having launched a homeschooling program, I realized how much of that language of marketing really matters. And I promised myself I would never sell other goose from a fear-based mindset. I just, I, I don't believe in it. I think more stuff usually gets in the way of the good stuff. And um, seeing kind of firsthand how so many Instagram captions are geared toward making you feel like you have the exact problem that this fill in the blank is a solution for, I think that gets really tricky. Um, and I think our kids need us and a library. (laughs) That's, that's really mostly it. Um, so if you, yeah, if you need accountability or want to stay on track or don't want to sift through Pinterest looking for a hundred different ideas, I think that's where your curriculum comes in. But, but I think the second that any homeschooling product positions, their curriculum is a solution that you need or else 
you know, um, I just don't think that's, that's beneficial uh, for anybody involved. I don't know. I think that's a tangent, but I get really fired up about, about being really mindful about the messages that you're receiving, I think on a day-to-day basis when you don't realize you're receiving them. Yeah, that is so good. And I have honestly thinking about that because there's so much noise in social media and, and online in general, like, you know, not even from a homeschooling standpoint, but just in general, like mothering and life in general, there's just so much noise out there now. So what does that look like for you actually to kind of, you don't want to be that for people with other goose. How do you shut out those noises for yourself? If that's still relevant to you, does that make sense? Yeah. You know, I um, spend a lot of time on social media. I'm not opposed. I just find I don't crave it. Um, I think, so I taught myself, I don't know, five or six years ago when, when the noise started to feel like too much. Um, and, and this is just with Instagram because I, I, don't, I don't have Facebook. I don't use Facebook. Um, I don't really use Twitter a whole lot. I'm never on Pinterest. I think, I think the one platform I do enjoy keeping up with old friends in is Instagram. But I, I kind of implemented a few rules of like five or six years ago, uh, meaning one of them is before I check anything on my phone, I ask myself as, if this is a good time for me. Um, my mother-in-law is always asking me that when she calls, which I think is the sweetest thing ever. She'll say, like, I'll just say, hi. And she's like, is this a good time? And she is <laughs> me just a check-in or can I drop something off or what? She's always asking that. And I thought, you know, I've never given myself the same courtesy. I've never honored my day to ask, is this a good time to like check in on what other people are doing or are the things that I could be doing and should be doing and want to do. So I've really learned to kind of respect respect my day in that way. Um, and I'm also an introvert. So I, I just really don't, my choice, like my, my day to day choices would not be, um, let me go to a huge party like every day. I would, I would never, I would just want to sit in bed with a book when I have free time. So when I'm given that quiet and that space, I really do take it, you know, I take it for myself and, um, I don't really hop on very much. Um, I, at the same time, I think it's a beautiful way to hear outside perspectives and ideas and interests. So it's fun when I, when I seek it out um, and I will every now and then. And I, it's so funny as an introvert because I think we think that those voices don't count or that energy doesn't count, but it does. It's, it's still like information input and with, you know, a hundred different people all at once. Um, so I, yeah, I think it, I, I think it counts for my energy level at least, but I don't know. Yeah, I can for sure relate. Okay. I have one more question I kind of want to ask you as we finish up our conversation. And that is if, you know, you were chatting with a mom that wants to start homeschooling and might be feeling overwhelmed by all the options out there. um, You know, I know we've touched on this for sure, but what are some tangible, you know, tips or advice that you have for that mom? I guess I can only speak to that like a seven and under age group because that's who we serve and where I am. But, um, I just say, again, start with what you already have. Uh, Maybe make a list of your family's goals, like your mission, your unique interests, um, your passions, any goals that you have like within your family. And and maybe just let that be your curriculum for a year, right? Um, Just try that on for size, build from there. Um, The stakes are super low in this age group. And I think it's really, I know what I ran into was, the advice that I received from other people was just wait, you've got plenty of time, you'll figure it out. But I, I wanted to do something intentional to kind of give it a trial run, right? Like to see if I could handle it and if I could manage it and if I wouldn't totally screw up my kids. And that was really good for me. So I would never tell anybody to like wait, right? Just, just wait. Um, instead I would say practice, but holding on to any sort of outcome or goal very loosely because there's no outcome in learning, right? It's a constant, continually evolving process. So picturing those early years as a time for connection and growth as a family unit and not about like cramming knowledge into your kids. Um, If we can look at it like it's sort of tilling the soil for just a really strong learning foundation in the future, I think that's a really great place to start. and yeah, it's, just, it's so much less about 
teaching your kids and really, really about teaching yourself, I think, um, in terms of being the parent that you want to be and that your kids need from you. Um, and, oh, I, I always forget to say, we have a really cool workshop. Um, it's totally free and it's like a week long. It covers everything from like socialization to uh, what the average homeschooling day looks like to different methods to like books and free resources. So it's super fun. It's really, and it's, yeah, you like, you take the workshop, you get, I don't know, six really, really mercifully short five minute videos delivered to your inbox. So it's, I think, I think the videos are spaced out by days. So you have time to kind of decompress and there's cute little homework with it. It's so fun. It is othergoose.com slash workshop. Okay. So when is like, what does, um, you can talk about that right now. Um, so that anyone who is interested in other goose, where can they find it? And when is, you know, is there like an enrollment period? What does that look like? Oh, totally. So, um, take the workshop. I always forget there's a workshop. Oh my gosh. I, that's so funny. Take the <laughs> um, and we kind of revamped it this summer to really gauge on what I, what I think it would be most helpful. Um, but yeah, you don't have to take the workshop. I just think it's helpful because then you'll just know whether it's for you or not for you. And that's just, it, it's always really helpful to know. And I don't believe in wasting people's time. So I would go to othergoose.com slash workshop. And then, um, our enrollment period, we open three times a year and our next enrollment is September 4th. So we will be open for just five days. There is a waiting list. So um, open nine four for five days and then we'll just get y'all set up. Okay, awesome. That sounds perfect. And I will kind of link all of that in the show notes. So I have two questions that I ask every guest. So the first one is what is something that you're simplifying right now? Okay, this is so backwards for my personality, but um, I recently lost my to-do list. Like, it, it vanished. I've looked everywhere. I, I, just, I don't even know where it went. <laughs> and um, it's, such clarity came from not having it, which is just bananas because I love writing things down. I like having lists. And um, so ever since, I just kind of have not – been keeping a to-do list, which sounds anti-simplification, but it's surprising how you just become hyper aware of the things that you have to have to do that day and everything else just kind of gets done in its own time. So I would say throwing away the, <laughs> the to-do list is a way that I've just really been simplifying. I, and I only work on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I work three days a week and then my husband works on Tuesday, Thursday. So we kind of do swapping, but, um, not having a list for what I need to do on the next day that I have a work day has just been oddly simplifying. I don't have it like a metaphor for what it, I don't know if it's like taking everything out of your pantry and then putting back in. Maybe it's like that, but it's been weird and so fun. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I love that. Okay. So last question is what's something that you can't stop talking about right now? Oh my gosh. Okay. Do you do butter coffee or do you know people that do butter coffee? Yeah, I've been doing it actually for the past couple of weeks. Yum. Okay. So I, I don't usually do a lot of dairy and I found that butter coffee was kind of too rich for me, even though I sort of loved the ritual of it. So a friend told me to do almond butter coffee. So I just put like a spoonful of almond butter or like cashew butter um, in it. I don't know if it does the same thing, but it's delicious. It's like nutty and savory and I like it so much better than the super rich creamy butter. So um, I, yeah, I just tell everybody I know that anytime they're like, oh, I don't do a lot of dairy. I'm like, you have to put almond butter in your coffee. Oh, that sounds so interesting. Okay. I'm going to yeah, have to try that. Do you blend it? Yes. Sorry. I always forget to say that because then there's like a clump of gross in the middle of your coffee. <laughs> yeah, I do. I blend it and it's delicious. And it's just almond butter. You don't add anything else. I do add MCT sometimes, but I also, I don't know. I can't tell if it works. And so I tend to, if, if I don't know that it's working, I just don't do it. But yeah. I it, right. I don't know. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Um, I'm going to have to try that. That sounds really good. Yeah. You will. It's good. Okay, well, thank you again so much. Um, I'm excited to learn more about Other Goose myself as my daughter nears the age of two. So yeah. thank you. Um, thank you for telling us all about what you do and, and your own homeschooling process. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It was such a treat. 
Okay, friend, I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. I just really appreciate Aaron's perspective and encouragement to pretty much just simplify the whole thing. Whether it's just the idea of building a foundation for learning in our kids' early years and doing a little bit of learning and schooling from home when they're super young, like two and three, or if it is branching out into trying out full-on homeschooling as they get a little bit older. I love how simple she encourages us to keep it. And I also think her perspective is just so refreshing that she doesn't believe there's one perfect way to school your kids. It's kind of why I did this whole series. I wanted to shed light on the fact that there are so many ways that we can live simply. There are so many ways that we can choose what's best for our families. And of course, a huge part of that, a huge part of what makes up our days is the way that we choose to work and the way that we choose to do school. So I just feel like that conversation about the fact that there is just not one right way, I feel like that really defines why I wanted to do this series in the first place. So what is super exciting is that Erin wants to let you try out Other Goose for free. I feel like you should take advantage of this if you have kids under seven. Even if they go to public school, even if you plan on sending them to public school, this is not just for homeschooling parents. She said that she really has a 50-50 split. It's all about connecting with our kids through learning, and I'm excited to try out Other Goose. My daughter is turning two in a matter of weeks, and I just cannot wait to put a little bit of structure to our day through having these little lesson plans and ways that we can connect with one another. So you can check that out. There's going to be a link in the show notes and you can get that free trial or you can just sign up for Other Goose if you're like willing to dive in. There's going to be a link for that as well. So if you were inspired by Erin, if you want a way to connect with your kids through learning, I highly recommend checking it out. And this goes without saying, but of course, of course, I recommend Erin's book, Chasing Slow, which is not about homeschooling. It is just a beautiful book about the journey of of slowing down and of choosing grace in the minimalist journey. So I recommend that book to everyone. There will be a link in the show notes for that as well. So next week on the show, I am going to be taking a break from these guest interviews on the subjects of work in school and I'm just gonna talk to you about the idea of changing our minds. Like what happens when we change our minds about the work that we've chosen for ourselves or the type of education we've chosen for our children or honestly, anything. Like what happens when we change our mind? Is that okay? What does that look like? And I'm gonna talk to you all about that because I personally have changed my mind a lot in these past few years. So we're just gonna unpack that question, we're gonna navigate that idea, and just know that we've got so much fun stuff coming up through the end of this year with Minimalish. It's all planned out, and I cannot express to you how truly excited I am for what's to come. So I feel like it's gonna be a super fun end to the year. So just make sure you hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And stay tuned, friend. I will talk to you on here next week.